So we, uh, we have a local boy up next, Stephen Jones, who's going to be telling us uh, a little bit about actually data sharing and how this works in uh, translational research and practice. Uh, great. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon. Um, before I get in, in, into the talk in, in detail, I guess, I mean, I think one of the problems that, that we're looking at or, or, or conceptualize the problem is kind of imagine two oncologists talking to each other, and one says to the other, I just had a patient with a really profound response to doxorubicin, and that's it. There's no punchline there. We'll ne learn nothing from that patient historically. That that would just be an anecdote that the the oncologist would um, would have and um, move on to the next patient. And that's been happening all the time, of course, in in healthcare. We've been we've been giving drugs and getting viral responses, and really having no mechanism to to understand uh, or study you know why one person responded or didn't in that clinical setting. Um, of course, now it wasn't the oncologist's fault. I mean, you know, now we have, you know, the internet where, where we can share data, and of course, genomics and, and and for cancer, this is very applicable. Of course, genomics gives us this wonderful kind of international currency of DNA sequence, which is is readily shareable in in ostensibly at least, you know, in in some way, and we can all understand. Uh, different mutations in, in uh, different genes, or at least attempt to. So what I'm going to talk about is, is our experience within British Columbia, and of course you, you all know that you are currently in British Columbia. Um, population just, just over four, four million, I believe. One of the things that, that, that we do have that I think is, is a really powerful agent in, in, in the way that we study cancer here um, is the fact that we have a single hospital um, that, that basically is responsible um, for registering and, and following and treating uh, all the patients uh, who come forward with uh, a, a cancer diagnosis in the province. So I think that, that we're doing really well in, in terms of being able to access patients, but of course 4.4 million, patient, uh, million people and the patients that derive from that actually isn't, isn't a huge amount. So to go back to kind of to go back to genomics, um, one of the things that we did, and this was a number of years ago now, um, I think this is, this is actually one of the first cases where uh, genomics was used actually to inform uh, the therapy um, uh, of a cancer patient. And in this case, we, we had a patient come through with an extremely rare tumor type, an, an adenocarcinoma of the lung. And I've told this story many times, I'm just kind of reiterate this in, in, in terms of what we were conceptualizing at the time. You know, we, we had no idea of what the underlying uh, drivers of this very rare tumor was. No one had studied it um, molecularly. You know, and so working with the clinician, he says, well, let's, let's look to see whether genomics gives us um, some clues. And to cut a very long story short, you know, what we were able to do is able to determine that this, this tumor was, was very clearly driven by uh, the RET oncogene and that we were able to give a, a RET inhibitor or a series of, of RET inhibitors which put the tumor into remission, at least um, for a period of time. So that was very encouraging. Um, you know, we had the technology, we, we, we had, um, you know, the enthusiasm to, to kind of move forward. And, and I think it, you know, I think, I think everyone in this room has the idea that, in, you know, in the future, a genomic analysis is really going to be a large part of uh, one's, uh, one's cancer treatment path. So what we've done is essentially uh, move that, uh, in the context of a trial at least, you know, into the clinic, um, where we're, we're now doing a full genomic and transcriptomic analysis of, on average, um, more than one patient a day. Um, and, you know, I've just given you a, a kind of uh, really quick overview of uh, what we're doing in terms of, you know, we, we, we have the consent, um, there's, there's, there's the biopsy process, there's there's the sequencing, there's of course, you know, all the uh, analytical processes in the alignment uh, interpretation. Um, and then of course we've assembled a kind of fairly large tumor board that then goes through all these results and tries to come up with, on the oncologist side and the clinician side, you know, what, 
what does the genomic information mean? Um, how can the patient be best served now that we uh, are, are in possession of this knowledge? I should say too that, that this is um, funded very, very generously by the BC Cancer Foundation here in, in, in British Columbia. So, you know, we've we developed a, a fairly extensive bioinformatics pipeline. Doing, doing a genome um, does allow us to do um, uh, things that, that you couldn't do necessarily with, with an exome or a panel. So we've been playing around a lot and developing a lot of tools that, that uh, look towards a de novo assembly in terms of defining fusions more accurately within the tumor, for instance. Um, so there's a various number of processes um, Using the transcriptome, um, actually, when we look past our cases, is actually very informative um, and not not typically done in this context. But um, uh, as we as we move forward, um, this this becomes a key part of our interpretation. Um, and then we work with with the civic database um, to kind of as a conduit to um, you know really pass on some of the actionable observations that um, you know we accrue over time. So. Um, what we do have to do is, is, is put something in the, in, in the hands of the, the clinician. Um, obviously, all the data has been stored electronically and, and accessed in a, in a research context in, in, in different ways. But, but what we're able to do is give the, um, the, the clinician a, a part of what we think the genomic and transcriptomic data is giving us. Um, these, are, these are basically um, interpreted by um, a PhD scientist um, who, who, who basically does a translation, who, who is giving a synopsis of, to the clinician uh, of what this data means, because the, the oncologists really aren't trained uh, at this moment, uh, or many of them, uh, you know, to really look in depth at what somatic variants uh, or, or underlying germline variants for that matter might, might mean for the patient. So, you know, what we have is this kind of large, large funnel where um, you know, we've got this concept of infrastructure of DNA sequencing machines, um, you know, and, and, and the bioinformatics um, to, you know, process that from a, log a logistical perspective. I mean, certainly we all know that we can um, sequence DNA. Um, we still, you know, have to apply a lot of knowledge. We're still learning a huge amount in terms of what kind of... Um, uh, analysis should be done, analyses should be done, uh, what tools should we be using, and, and certainly a large amount of our time is, is, is really then taken in terms of what, what's our interpretation of, of that data. And kind of really important too, and, 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 and the data sharing and, and what we ultimately do with this data is, is part of this, but communication, taking that data and going back to a practicing clinician, um, that's a huge amount of, of work as well. Um, and, you know, we really shouldn't uh, underestimate what we need to do to kind of make that work really, really well. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a quick, a, a quick example, and I, and I know I've given this example a number of times, so a number of people in the room I know have, have heard this, but, but this, is, this is one, I think, nice example, um, you know, of what the program can achieve in terms of um, one... One patient, a 67-year-old female, um, stage three colon cancer, um, and very, very standard uh, therapeutic uh, regime. And I'm trying to, um, uh, as would be typical, there's, there's a recurrence um, in November 2012, um, and a recurrence near the spine. Um, attempt to reduce um, the, the, uh, the effect through radiation, um, and then recurrence back in then 2014. And this is where we came in to say, is there something about this tumor um, that, that might give us some, some therapeutic insight? So um, tumor actually was, was, was fairly hypermutated. We had about uh, 1,500 uh, single nucleotide variants, um, 604 indels. Um, and lots of standard uh, bad actors, I guess, um, you know, were recognized in that. What, what we noticed was actually um, very, very different, in fact, unique to this tumor, uh, was very, very high levels of FOS and JUN. Um, and when we 
again, have the power of looking back over all our data and, and the power of looking through all of TCGA, for instance, we, we noticed that this, this was a very unique phenomena. Um, we hadn't observed these kind of levels of, of expression of, 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 of these genes. And then what we can look at is, well, you know, where do these genes lie? Well, where they lie downstream of the, and, the angiotensin uh, receptor pathway, and the angiotensin receptor is uh, a therapeutically, therapeutically amenable receptor, um, but typically, of course, used um, as a blood pressure medication. What we were able to do, um, the clinician, um, I guess, thought that the risk would be low to, 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 to try this drug um, contrary to the, the potential benefit. So um, you can look at the spine METS here. This is in November 2014. And then after um, a few weeks of, of giving the blood pressure medication, basically um, the tumor totally disappeared. Um, and I can kind of flick back. You can kind of see um, various graphs where it's um, just totally absent. Um, and actually, actually, the patient remained totally cancer-free for, uh, I believe, at least one and a half years um, while continuing to be on this blood, medi blood pressure medication. So, of course, you know, at some level this is an anecdote, but how do we not make this an anecdote, right? I think that is what I'm here, you know, essentially talking about. You know, how many other similar patients, you know, are there around the world that could benefit from that. Presumably not many, but there's gonna be some. Presumably this isn't the, the first person ever in the world to have, have this kind of molecular feature. Um, so yeah, there'd be patients conceivably in Canada, there'd be patients conceivably around the world, and so how do we match up those, 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 those patients? And even if we wanna study it further, we need to be able to identify other patients, um, and it's rare, so it's, we may never see another one in British Columbia, but you know, how do we come up with this infrastructure? Um, you know, what I would like to do in, in, in kind of the, the data sharing that, that, that I'm gonna come back to later is, you know, what would be phenomenal is, is if we can give out genomic data and say, here is the genome of a tumor that was previously treated with drugs A and B. And that, that, that's gonna be key, because these turn these tumors, evolve these tumors into types of disease that have never typically been seen on this planet before. Um, we want to know the genotype of a tumor that responds to drug Y. Um, and again, we want to know the genotypes you know, of, of tumors that, that respond or fail to respond to drug X, for instance. And of course, it's, it's, it's numbers that are gonna be important in, in, in our ability to, to interpret any of that. So, so what I wanna just introduce in, in, in the last few minutes is, is really what we're doing in Canada. I think it's a very exciting exciting project that's been funded by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. Um, I'm involved, but it's, in, it's, it's, it's led by Michael Budno out of um, sick, sick Kids and University of, uh, University of Toronto. Um, it, ha it has an, an envelope uh, of around $5 million over, over the next few years to really look about how we can develop these kind of data sharing infrastructure in 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 Canada and, and to link hospitals so we can ask exactly these these kind of questions. Um, so I'm not really going to go into this in, in, in great detail. Carl Vertan and, and Jonathan Dursey made these slides for me. Um, but what I can emphasize is, you know, and, and this is a large part of our application was 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 that we're going to link the, the, these hospitals together, but we're going to use the Global Alliance APIs, you know, as as the basis. Um, of our data sharing. Um, and initially, really, uh, I think the, hu the huge potential of being able to link up, say, three major cancer centers in, in Canada so we can identify more patients that can quickly go onto clinical trials will be actually key. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at this being fully, fully distributed around at least three hospitals initially within, within Canada. Obviously, we want to be able to distribute the metadata we'll be going through Global Alliance APIs, for instance, for all this. And again, a large part um, of, of our thinking, you know, that there are constraints in, in terms of how the health systems work and, 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 and their conservativeness in, in terms of who accesses data and, and uh, uh, where it actually resides. So, you know, we're working within that context as well. A um, lot of work, many questions. Uh, 
I mean, in terms of you know how we'll implement this, um, authentication, of course, is uh, you know w one of our first issues. We've we've actually contributed um, authentication code back back into the Global Alliance server, for instance, so, so that we have more choice in the kinds of authentications that the hospitals may may want to use. So I'm going to end there. Um, there's positions available if anyone's interested on November 9th to apply. And I'm just going to uh, acknowledge all the people, at least in British Columbia, that, that have been working on the, uh, the cancer project that I gave an example of. Thank you. Time for one trick question. If I might quickly ask one then. Um, do you think the sort of the matchmaker exchange principle of <laughs> Putting up someone saying, I had someone, they responded to this, has somebody else got it that responded to that? Do you think that is, is, is a way in which people, in time, terms of building up these stories, getting people interested in potentially yeah. doing the biology of it? And right, on, but uh, just on the top of my head, I, I guess instead of the phenotype, it, it, it would be the genotype that we're actually putting out there as saying, he, he, here's a tumor that looks like this, but it's gonna be the genotype of that tumor as opposed to here's a patient with these features. Um, yes, if, or if, they if, responded if, to if, this if that drug, makes sense, yes. Know, that, that's yeah. the sort of thing yeah. that you think, think yeah. of it.